Yep. Okay. All right. So we were. Um, let's see where we were. Yeah, I was explaining the box normalization. The um, continuum normalization is to delta cubed zero, which is v over two pi cubed. In other words, the integral of e to the i x dot zero d cubed x. And um, so that's v over two pi cubed times the box normalization, which of course is just unity. So to turn this into um, box, to go to revert to box normalization, let's see. Okay, so what we have then, we want M box. And M box then has these guys in it. And so it is 2 pi q over V raised to the power of the number of incoming particles plus the number of number of initial state particles plus the number of final state particles times M, which is M continuum. So what that does is it turns the continuum normalization into box normalization. So now we have something that is uh, of, of normal size. Now, let's see, can you rotate it? Because we're going to have. So now the probability is simply S box squared, which is 2 pi squared M box squared delta 4 of p prime plus k prime minus p minus k squared. Okay, well, this of course would cause a hiccup also because what's the square of a delta function? And um, well, what we realized is that this one delta 4 is going to be used to resolve the final state integration but uh, the integration of the sum over final states. And the other delta function is going to be delta, uh, delta fourth of zero. But that is just, uh, um, by our formula over there, that is just the volume of the box uh, times the time of the, of the scattering, basically, uh, divided by 2 pi to the fourth. So in other words, integral p4 of x is equal to 2 pi to the 4 delta 4 of 0. And that's equal to gt. And so what we have then is the probability is 2 pi squared uh, 2 pi cubed over v to the fourth power because there are two incoming, two outgoing particles m squared, where it's that m over there, and then vt over 2 pi to the fourth, and then delta 4 of p prime plus k prime minus p minus k. So that's our probability. The, the rate is then just that divided by t, so the rate is, is, is that. And that turns out to be 2 pi to the 10th divided by v cubed m squared delta of p prime plus k prime minus p minus k. So that's our expression for the rate. And now we have to just uh, sum over final states. So the rate, in other words, is, uh, or I can write it this way, dw is this times um, v over 2 pi cubed. I should have done this in two lines. Let me, let me leave it like that, like this, and I'll go to the next line. 
So now our DW is then this structure, 2 pi to the 10th over V cubed, N squared delta. Let me, maybe I'll just write it at, well, P prime plus K prime minus P minus K. And now we multiply by, we're going to sum over final states, and we're going to do that in box normalization effectively. And so what we have is V over 2 pi cubed squared D cubed P prime D cubed K prime. So this is just exactly what we did in going, we're going effectively from box to continuum normalization. This is the way we did it in the previous case. Except that in the previous cases, what we were doing was we were having a photon scattering of an atom. So we didn't have, so the atom had essentially infinite mass, and we didn't consider the final state momentum of the atom. All right, to get the cross section, we divide by the flux, and the flux here is C over V, but we're in natural units, so that's 1 over V. And so the, and when we divide by 1 over V, the V's go away altogether, because this is V squared over V cubed, so that's 1 over V. When we divide by 1 over V, well, let me just write it this way. D sigma then is, looking at the 2 pi's, we've got 2 pi to the 6 here, so this is 2 pi to the 4. M squared delta P prime plus K prime minus P minus K P cubed P prime P cubed K prime. Okay, so this is an expression that finally um, makes sense. We don't have to jiggle with it anymore. There are no volumes in there. There are no unwanted infinities. It's basically exactly what we want. And this is then the same as Weinberg's um, 8.77 um, with uh, his U equal to 1, which is um, what is his uh, 8.7 so um, it's the same as Weinberg is going to be right. Um, the the more general thing, the more general expression would be to have a U inverse here for the relative velocity of the initial state particles. A U inverse, but we have U is equal to one because where the particle is moving, in, it's a photon moving in the speed of light. More generally, this U is given by a square root of, of the two, if two incident particles of P1 and P2, P1 dot P2 squared minus M1 squared and 2 squared, all that divided by E1, E2. And in this case, um, if we go to the rest frame, yeah, I should have said this, that, that uh, and in the rest frame of the uh, electron. In the rest frame of the electron, the electron P is just M zero. And so this dot product is um, just M times K zero. And the mass of the photon is zero. So this thing is just um, square root of M K zero squared divided by M K zero, and that's one. So that's why we have one here. Okay, now, let me just mention something about the Feynman diagram. Can you switch the camera around just a little bit? These X and Y are space-time points. And you notice that whereas Weinberg, perhaps because of the, it might, it might have been the editor, or the artist who drew them this way. I think it's nicer to draw the Feynman diagrams this way, where the x and the y, see time is flowing this way, but by drawing this line horizontal, I've allowed 
the possibility that x could be after y or before y. And over here, y could be before or after x. Okay. So the, that's why I make the line horizontal. And in fact, we're integrating d4 of x, d4 of y. So in fact, sometimes this y can be much later than this x for this diagram, and the same thing for that diagram. So just a word about what the diagram is actually um, look like, and what they mean. All right, now I don't know how I don't know how much detail to go through this, but I suppose a little detail would be better. Then then we can look at some other processes. So um, uh, Weinberg introduces the notation omega for this, and this is minus e dot k over m. And the same thing for omega prime is equal to minus e dot k prime over m. And then we're in the rest frame of initial electron. And uh, when Compton did his experiments, he was using x-rays on, uh, I guess, I guess atoms. I don't really know what is electron is, what state is electron. Um, so the, we have here a delta fourth. When we do the p prime integration, this delta fourth of um, p prime just says p prime equal to um, p plus k minus um, k prime. But in fact, p is equal to zero because we're in the rest frame of the photon, uh, of the electron, initial electron. So p prime is just equal to k minus k prime. So we've got p prime vector is k minus k prime. That's what's enforced by the three part of the delta function. The rest of the delta function is delta of p prime zero plus k prime zero minus p zero minus k zero. And this is equal to delta of square root of, well, the momentum of the electron we just found out is k minus k prime three vector squared plus n squared. And then this is omega prime. And this is n. And this is omega. So this is our delta function of energy. And so that means that, that the square root of, well, if we square this thing up, um, th this is omega squared. Um, this is omega prime squared, and this is minus 2 k dot k prime, which is the same thing as minus 2 omega dot, omega omega prime times cosine of the angle of scattering. So this is omega squared minus 2 omega omega prime cosine theta uh, plus omega prime squared plus n squared is equal then to omega plus m minus omega prime. And you can solve for that, and the solution is that omega prime is equal to omega times m over m plus omega 1 minus cosine theta. And this is called omega compton of theta. And um, that formula, when that was verified experimentally by Compton in 22 or 23, 1922 or 1923, um, that, that really gave um, scientific credibility to Einstein's idea that photons were, were particles, um, particles of light. Light consisted of particles called photons. Um, now, this delta function that we have here can be written as delta then of omega minus omega compton of theta, which is what it certainly is, but there's a scale factor, and the scale factor that you divide by 
is the absolute value of the partial derivative of, and it's this, it's this, this big long square root um, plus omega prime with respect to omega prime. So that the absolute value of that. And if you do the arithmetic, I'm going to skip the details. You get e prime zero, omega prime over m omega delta of omega prime minus omega Compton theta. So that's this is um, so that's the sort of tricky tricky part of the final state uh, integration. And of course the EQ k prime can be written as omega prime squared t omega prime d omega. Things like this are much easier in natural units. You remember when we were dealing with the case of light scattering all the time, Rayleigh and Thompson scattering, I had to multiply by h bar c and divide by h bar c to get the units right. In natural units, you can just slide along and these h bars and c's of one. So it's, it's a real advantage to use natural units. Um, also, it means that if you screw up with an h bar or a c, it doesn't matter because they're all one. Whereas if you are doing a real calcula a calculation in normal units and you're off by an h bar, well, you're, I mean, you're, you're not even close. I mean, you're just you're off typically by a 10 to the 20th. So, so that's something you want to avoid. Did you want to have a tear something to say? All right. So we're down to uh, our cross section. D sigma is this. We integrated dq p prime, that fixed p prime. We now integrate over uh, dq k prime, and that fixes omega prime to be omega Compton. And we get as our cross section d sigma then, and it is uh, 2 pi to the fourth absolute value of the matrix element squared p prime zero omega prime cubed over m omega p omega. So this is the differential scattering cross section. Now, and, and in this case, p prime zero is equal to m plus omega minus omega prime. Omega prime is given by this expansion. All right. Now, you might think that you had to work out up to this point all these different ideas, and frankly, seeing it for the first time, this is a workout for you, for anybody. But um, the real chore is hidden in this thing, this matrix element squared. Because fortunately, there are computers these days, whereas back, back in the 20s and 30s and 40s, there essentially weren't any. And um, even back in the 60s, uh, when I was a graduate student, these, um, we looked at this with um, fear and anxiety, or at least uh, we knew you were in for it. Okay, well, let's, um, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the most common case, namely in which we we don't measure the spin of the initial or final electron, which is normally the case. And so <coughs> this d sigma bar then is going to be one half the sum over sigma prime and sigma. These are the things that I was sometimes calling R because I had been using R for polarization of the electrical photon. But um, Weinberg uses sigma for the sigma, so I'm going to switch to sigma. Anyway, it just means whether it's whether the electron is spin up or spin down in z direction. So the spin is spin. And we're going to be summing then this d sigma like that. So, so we're going to be averaging over the initial state of the electron and summing over final state spin to the electron. Now we're going to be using, remember in our expression for u, for m, if we look back on that board over there, we see that it involves u bar and u. 
And so that means that we can take advantage of this marvelous spin sum formula, which is U, say, alpha, of P and sigma, U bar beta of P and sigma. This is really three-dimensional P, but I'm not going to write it in arrows. This thing is equal to minus I P slash plus M divided by 2P0. And so this is a major space between you take the alpha beta component. Or, of course, the only part that's a matrix is the numerator. So that's what we're going to use here for that. Now, this D sigma has an M squared in it. And so what we're going to be doing is, I guess I better start a new thing here. The sum over sigma and sigma prime of U, M is going to be U bar, U prime bar. And I just write it as A U squared. Okay. So what is this? This is sum sigma, sigma prime. So this is then U bar prime, U prime bar, actually, A U. And now it's going to be U bar prime A U complex conjugate. And so this is the sum sigma, sigma prime of U bar, U prime bar A U. And now when we do this thing, we get U adjoint A beta. Beta is the mission, so we just get beta U prime. But now, remember that I said to you that beta squared is 1. So we can stick a beta squared in here. And so now this is the sum sigma, sigma prime, U prime bar A U, U bar, beta, A dagger, beta, U prime. So that's how we're going to do this thing. Did the beta come at zero? No. Beta did this from gamma zero by an I. And whether you multiply by I or divide by I, I don't remember. I wrote it down correctly on Monday. But it's not here in my notes at the moment. But it differs from gamma zero by an I. So beta squared is 1. In fact, I think the square root is gamma zero by an I. OK. But now this A, you see, is that horrible matrix between the curly brackets back there, which involves epsilon prime star bracket, 4 by 4 matrix, epsilon slash, and then epsilon slash, another 4 by 4 matrix, epsilon prime star slash, and then dividing by the 2 P dot K, and so forth. So this A is a complicated business. But there's one more thing to notice here. Remember what's cute for this. I mean, if you're going to do this with actual spinach, it would be sort of complicated. It's going to be complicated no matter what you do. But if you have an alpha here and a beta there, then you can pull this alpha and this beta. And in fact, let me just rewrite this slightly, namely some sigma sigma prime A U alpha U bar beta B A dagger beta A dagger beta U prime U prime bar. OK. And now we can put in indices. If this is a beta, then this is, so to speak, gamma delta. And then this is this thing, delta epsilon, say. And then this thing is epsilon alpha. So this is, I could have put, you put the same indices up here. In other words, this is epsilon alpha. This is epsilon. This is delta. This is, whoops, this should have been beta gamma. This is beta gamma. This is gamma. This is delta. This is delta alpha. 
آپ تھیلا تھیلا کیا نا کیم جا رہا ہوں تو So that's the way it works. Now you can recognize this is a product of 4x4 matrices where, where the U, U, U bar is this 4x4 matrix here. And this whole thing then is the trace of A and then U, U bar. Well, U, U bar is minus I P slash plus M over 2P0. Then we have beta A dagger beta. And then this is minus I P prime slash plus M over 2P prime zero. Okay. Close parentheses. All right. Now that looks very complicated. But you ain't seen nothing yet because we now stick in A and then A between the betas and the A's of those Well, let me just write down what the answer is then. Uh, and in fact, M, you know, is closely related to U bar AU in this notation. And so I'll just skip to what M actually is. So the sum of the spin, sigma prime sigma of M squared, turns out to be E to the fourth over 64 pi to the 6, omega, omega prime, p0, p0 prime, or p prime 0, actually, times a trace of the first expression is the A. Well, the A is the thing between the U bar and the U over there. So this is equal to Also, Weinberg used E instead of epsilon as his um, polarization vector. So I'm going to switch to his notation just because I constantly have to change. So E prime star slash minus I P slash plus K slash plus M E slash over P dot K. So we finally cancel the two there. Minus E slash minus I P slash minus K prime slash plus M. E prime star slash over P dot K prime. Okay, that was the A. But now we have this structure here, which is minus I P slash plus M. I don't know what that is. Anyway, we factored out the um, uh, 2P0. Let's come out to the front here. And then what I don't see is what has happened to the pole. Okay, I need to tell you what happens to the betas, beta, uh, to the beta A dagger beta. Well, all right, here's what happens. Um, remember, beta squared is one. And it's also true that beta, gamma mu dagger beta, is equal to minus gamma mu. Um, I don't remember whether that's universally true for all possible uh, choices of gamma matrices and of betas, but um, it's certainly true in the notation where you're using choice these made. So that's a minus gamma mu. So we've got, we've basically taken the adjoint of this expression and then moved through the betas and um, the, the effect of that is to turn every it is to flip the sign of all the gamma gamma views and well I'm not going to try to go through that in detail let me just tell you what the upshot is the upshot is 
It's epsilon star slash. Remember, there's no prime on it. No, there's no prime on it. Minus I P slash plus K slash plus M. Epsilon prime slash over P dot K. Minus epsilon prime slash minus I P slash minus K slash plus M. P star slash over P dot K prime. And then finally times minus I P prime slash plus M. Okay. So you just have to take the trace of this thing. And you can see that's a tall order. All right. So, however, there are a lot of simplifications before. So it's not nearly as bad as, 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 as we're thinking of. Um, now, we're, we're in the Coulomb gauge, and we have an E dot P. This is, this is the photon one dot P. Well, E has no time component. Uh, these E are photon polarization vectors. No time component. And um, this P has only a time component because we're in the rest frame of the um, of the uh, elect of the electron. So e, e star dot P and E prime dot P and E prime star dot P. These are all zero. So that that helps. <coughs> also, let me see the problem with this room is with so little space. Remember that our gamma matrices are defined as gamma mu gamma nu is equal to two gamma mu nu. In fact, this is the only requirement that the gamma matrices must satisfy. It's just this anti-commutation relation. And so what that tells us is that, for example, P slash epsilon slash plus or E slash P slash. What is this? Well, if we write it out, it's P mu E nu times the anti-commutator of gamma mu with gamma nu. Okay. But the anti-commutator is 2 eta mu nu P mu P nu. So this is just 2 P squared, which is minus 2 M squared. Oh, I'm sorry. This is not P. This is P E nu. So this is this is 2 P dot E, which we already saw was 0. So in other words, what we can do Oh, so little space. All right, I'm going to start erasing over here. I'll just erase this over here. Is there a question? Remember, I have chocolate, so if you have a question, I will give you a chocolate. Okay, let's start erasing. Okay, we have this structure here, 
then what we can do, since we've seen that, where is it? P slash E slash plus E slash P slash is zero. We can just, if we just get a minus sign, if we move this, we just change the sign of this term if we move the E slash through. So this gives us P slash times I P slash plus N minus I P slash plus N. And now, um, there's obviously a cancellation here. So this is E slash times P slash squared uh, plus N squared. The cross terms cancel. But now P slash P slash is P mu, P mu, gamma mu, gamma mu, which is P mu, P nu, um, I guess I can write this, I should have written this as one half the anti-commutator. I think I made a mistake down here. I think for the one half. But it's zero in any case. In this case, we get uh, E squared is minus M squared. So what this turns into then is E slash minus M squared plus M squared to zero. So this whole complicated expression here is just zero. All right, so that's the simplification there. And if you apply this trick and other analogous tricks, this, this whole thing does simplify. And you get a sum over Siemens of n squared. It turns out to be minus e to the fourth over 64, 2 pi to the sixth, omega, omega prime, p zero, prime zero. And then a big trace. But the trace isn't nearly as bad as it was. Now what we've got is e prime star slash k slash e slash over p dot k plus p slash k prime slash e star prime slash p dot k prime times minus i p slash plus m. And then this is multiplied by E star slash K slash prime slash over P dot K plus E prime slash K prime slash E star slash over P dot K prime minus I P prime plus M. All right, that's the end of the trace. So, at least it fits on one line now. Okay, well, what you do at this point is you, subs you, you multiply all this out, and then you identify the terms as either having six or eight gamma matrices. It turns out that a trace, all right, here's something really helpful. Trace, gamma, uh, let us say mu1, gamma mu2, gamma mu2 n plus 1, always zero. So the trace of an odd number of gamma matrices is always zero. That means that you only have to worry about the products here that have an even number of slashes. And um, it turns out that then you have, uh, well, you have four that are that ha are traces of eight gammas, and four that are traces of six gammas. And um, 
Well, Weinberg shows in the appendix how to compute these things. I think, I think, in view of the time, that we'll just skip to the end and give the answer. Um, the answer is that this sum over m squared turns out to be e to the fourth over 64. Boy, that is weird. It has a factor of 8 that can be canceled. It doesn't want to be canceled. I don't know why. Anyway, 2 pi to the 6, omega, omega prime, p0, p prime 0, 8, k dot k prime squared over k dot p, k prime dot p, plus 32, p dot prime squared. Okay. And this calculation might have been simpler, but Weinberg, I guess, thought it was, you know, you can't resist the sort of force. So he did it in an arbitrary Lorentz frame. If when we specialize to the laboratory frame of the, uh, elect of the rest frame of the electron, what we get is that this d sigma bar, which is which is half the sum of the sigma sigma prime of m squared and so forth, it simplifies to e to the fourth omega prime squared d omega over 64 pi squared m squared omega squared times omega over omega prime plus omega prime over omega minus 2 and then plus 4 e dot e prime squared. So that's the final cross section. And this was derived actually by Klein and uh, Nishina in 1929, um, which was about uh, six years after Compton's experiments. So that's that's the uh, actual uh, result there. Now, but this is for this is for the case of a specific polarization for the initial photon and the final photon. The initial photon is usually not polarized, um, at least for X-rays. And um, so in that case, if we use this formula that we've been using in, uh, remember, one half sum of, of polarizations, E i e j is one half delta i j minus k i i is something I've been using, or we've been using in scattering light on atoms many, many times. Um, if you do that, you get a simple, uh, a somewhat simpler expression. So let me write the expression down below. So now if you sum over the polarizations, if you have unpolarized initial state photons then, it's um, it's the same factor, so let me just write ditto. It's, it's in fact, everything is the same except for the last term. No, no, not everything. All right, let me, let me do it. Omega over omega prime plus omega prime over omega. And now what we have is minus 2 k prime hat dot e prime squared. Okay, and so what you see then is that the final state photons um, are preferentially polarized so that they are, um, I don't want to say this, let me get it right, it's perpendicular to the initial and final direction. Well, E prime 
I'm puzzled. Is that really? That's a K, not a K prime. Okay, we know that E prime is perpendicular to K prime, just because we're in Coulomb gauge, so the photon, K prime is the photon direction, and epsilon prime or E prime has to be perpendicular to, to it, it's the polarization vector. But here, what we see is that to the extent that E prime is parallel to the initial photon direction, to that extent, cross-section goes down because of the minus sign. So the cross-section is biggest when the polarization vector of the final photon is perpendicular to both K and K prime. So in other words, let me maybe write it this way. If you have, say, the photon K coming in and K prime out, and suppose they're in the board, then E prime tends to be perpendicular like this. Perpendicular, so it's either this or it's preferentially into outer board or into the board. And this actually has been, this is something that's well known apparently to astronomers because you can have a, um, a couple of eclipsing stars. Now, how do you, so one star is behind another. And so you're seeing, I guess, the, all right, let me just read what he says here. The light from one of the stars is polarized when it is scattered by three electrons in the outer atmosphere of the other cooler star, and both are in the line of sight. So the photons coming from this one, scattering off this, so K and K prime are so kind of both coming at us. And um, so I guess the polarization in this case would be sort of up or down. Um, and it's normally undetectable in the star because um, then you'd be integrating over the whole uh, all parts of the star, uh, the, the, the star's disk. But um, anyway, all right, I don't want to dwell on this. When, if, if you finally go to the point where you sum over final polarizations also, then um, then what you get is you get the same formula. But, um, so you get, so this is d sigma bar bar. So d sigma bar 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 is the same factor out in front. D to the fourth omega prime squared at the omega. Well, I'm never going to have time. Space to write points. Just erase it. Anyway, d sigma bar 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 is then e to the fourth omega prime squared omega over 32 pi squared n squared omega squared and then omega over omega prime plus omega prime over omega minus 1 plus cosine squared of theta so that's the scattering angle and um, so what does this tell us? This tells us that the cross section is biggest for um, forward scattering or backward scattering. And so when if you have electrons at rest and you're hitting them with x-rays, you get more scattering forward and backward than to the sides. Again, per d omega, of course it's a lot more d omega on the sides. Alright, well I think all right, then you can integrate over the whole um, solid angle to get the total cross-section and um, let me see if he's doing that in a special limit. Yeah, he's, so he's integrating 
Yeah, you see, this omega prime is itself a complicated function of theta. So finding the total cross-section isn't trivial. You can't just integrate over cosine squared theta and ignore these guys, because these guys depend on theta in a complicated way. But in the non-relativistic limit, they don't. And in that case, one gets, in the non-relativistic limit, one gets sigma Thompson, which is e to the fourth over six pi n squared. And this is something that can also be written as eight pi r zero squared over three, where r zero is about three fermions. That's the classical radius of the electron. This formula is one we got in the infrared limit of the Thompson scattering cross-section. And we did Thompson scattering. If you go to the low frequency limit, this is what you get. All right, well, Jesus, this is already five o'clock. Do you want me to go on a little bit and talk about the question? Do you want me to go on a little bit, or should we just quit? I could say something about these other Feynman diagrams. But it's already five o'clock. So come on, give me a sense of the question. Shall we quit or not? I need to get going. You need to get going. Does anybody want to hang around, and I'll go a little further? Or is it yes or no? I'm happy to quit, or I'm happy to go on a little bit. I think this, I think I, in retrospect, spent too much time on the Thompson scattering. But it's, in a sense, you know, you want to see what's going on. Any of the other processes, it's basically the same sort of story. Well, here, I'll write the other Feynman diagrams down. Why don't I do that? And those of you who want to leave, can leave, and I'll just turn off the machine. If everybody leaves, I'll just stop. All right, hold it. OK, so these are the two diagrams for complex scattering. This is the process gamma plus E goes to gamma plus E. Now, what if the thing were instead positron, electron, photons or positrons? Well, in that case, the diagrams would simply be like this. And the other one would be so the diagrams would look like that. All right, what about electron-electron scattering? Electron-electron scattering would look like this. And if you put the P's in, P1, P2, P1 prime, P2 prime, but you can see that this would also involve another diagram. P1, P2, P2 prime, P1 prime. In other words, the electron P1 prime can come out of the first vertex or the second vertex. And if memory serves me, there's an overall minus sign between these two. In other words, when you compute this, this generates a minus sign in all of the family. If this were positron-positron scattering, it would look like this. And then you get, so one, two, one prime, two prime, and you'd also have some photon line, one, two, two prime, one prime. Okay, so these are the cases for E plus and P 
minus plus E plus and minus goes to E plus and minus plus E plus and minus. On the other hand, what about if it's um, electron-positron scattering? Well, one diagram is certainly this. But there's another diagram. So P1, P2, P1 prime, P2 prime, P1 prime, P2 prime, P1, P2. And you can actually, I, I, I think I put the Feynman, yeah, I put the Feynman rules on one. You can follow those Feynman rules. By the way, the, the what I, I think I'll, I'll, modify the Feynman rules that are online by adding a couple of diagrams that are helpful um, in, in applying his Feynman rules, um, his version of Feynman rules. Um, okay, well, there, this I think I've just about covered the different possible diagrams. There may be a couple more of them. Are worth noting explicitly. And these are um, P plus plus P minus goes to gamma plus gamma. So what does that look like? Looks like this. P, P prime, and of course there are two of these. In other words, K1, K2, K2, K1. So those are two fine diagrams there. Um, for the other process, gamma plus gamma goes to E plus plus E minus. There what you've got is photon 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 K1 K2 P1 prime P2 prime or maybe I can just call it P1 P2 since and, and the other possibility is K2, K1, like that. Okay, so these are these are the um, Feynman diagrams, which you can then you can then you see after you've done uh, I mean, we did the common scattering in detail. If you do one or two of these by yourself in detail, you'll start then seeing how it is that these. Um, Feynman diagrams can occur, and what, why the rules occur the way they do. And um, the rules essentially are so the rule is for every the rule is you write down all the possible diagrams of the process that you're talking about, and I think I've written down most of them there. And then anytime you have a vertex that looks like this, with um, say K alpha, K prime beta, and the photon Q, he doesn't want to put an arrow on them, but the Q is going into the vertex. So I'm putting an arrow on it. This, picture, this part of the picture represents 2 pi to the fourth E gamma mu beta alpha or delta 4 of K minus K prime plus Q. Then for the external lines, if you've got 
an external line going up and out. This is represented by U bar, say a beta here, and the P and the sigma. Then this is U bar beta P sigma over square root of 2 pi cubed, 2 pi to the 3 halves. For a final positron line, that looks like this. Let's say an alpha P sigma. This is V alpha P sigma over 2 pi to the 3 halves. So the positron lines, that's like in this picture, you see. When we create a final state positron, the line looks like this. And the reason why it sort of has to look like that is you see you want this line to be continuous. And in fact, this line will represent what you'll have here is you'll have um, a U bar, an A slash, uh, an electron propagator, another A slash, and then a V. And uh, that's why this line is a V. It will come out that way when you do the calculation. On the other hand, um, so this is a final state electron. So in other words, there's some sort of a diagram here and it's coming out. An initial state electron is U alpha P sigma over 2 pi to 3 heads, as you've seen. And an initial state positron line looks like this, but it's a P bar beta over 2 pi to the 3 halves. You've seen the photon lines many times, but maybe it's worthwhile mentioning that the photon lines look like this over 2 pi to the 3 halves square root of 2 p 0. So you saw the square root of 2 omega, or square root of 2 k 0, or 2 omega, uh, in the in the atom light, light on atoms formula formulation. But then the V turns into 2 pi to the 3 halves. Square root of V turns into 1 over 2 pi to the 3 halves. And then the 2 epsilon 0 just goes, the epsilon 0 goes away because we're not in the right unit. And then anytime you have an internal line, so an internal, say, fermion line, what we've seen are internal fermion lines in common scattering. And what you get is minus i over 2 pi to the fourth, minus i k slash plus m alpha beta over k squared plus m squared minus i epsilon, and sometimes you need to keep the minus i epsilon. This is what is represented by a line like this going from beta to alpha with momentum k. Um, so that's going from a vertex carrying a uh, Dirac label beta to another vertex carrying a Dirac label alpha. Uh, for the photon lines like this one here, what you have is simply minus i over 2 pi to 4 beta mu nu over q squared minus i epsilon. Notice that when the intermediate state particle is on the mass shell, that is to say physical, this thing is huge. So this, that's because q squared is zero then. And over here, if this electron is actually at resonance, that is to say it's a physical electron as opposed to a virtual electron, then this k squared is minus m squared and this whole thing blows up. So the fact this propagated is, is biggest, the closer k can get to the mass shell. And um, incidentally, if, if we had here a propagator instead for, say, a W boson or a Z boson, instead of this Q squared minus I epsilon, you'd have something like Q squared plus AM squared minus I epsilon. But now for, any, for low energy Q squared, this would be something of the order of KEV or MEV. And this, due to the co-potential, 
No, no, no. This is for the weak interactions. Weak. Yeah. This is a. So this would be the, this. This would be a line where if this could happen in electron electron scattering. You can have a C zero go across. And the mass of the C zero is around 90 GeV. So you have 90 GeV squared here. So for normal processes, you don't see this because it's hugely suppressed. And that suppression, in fact, is why the inter why the weak interactions are weak. They're weak because the masses of these exchange bosons are so high, whereas the mass of the photons is quite low. So effectively, they're short, they're extremely short range interactions. In other words, if you interpret it the way you were interpreting it, at, which you may, or you, then you're interpreting it as a Yukawa potential. Then the uh, then what you say is that it's a Yukawa potential of extremely short range. And so that's another way of thinking of it. But, but it's still a weak interaction. Um, so you were right, it is a power potential. Anyway, um, so that, that's, uh, that's basically it. I mean, this, you know, this quantum field theory is a, is a very, very big subject. And um, Weinberg worked one volume on quantum field theory and then another volume on quantum field theory of gauge fields, and then another volume on quantum field theory with supersymmetry. And, um, and that doesn't even give you the strings. So whether strings are true or not in other matters. Oh, I forgot to cast these out, but I guess you've had enough of these pieces. You don't really want any. All right, well, have a nice summer. Anytime um, uh, you want to chat, I'm available as long as it's late in the day. Um, are there any questions? Anyway, from the Yukawa point of view, you can say that weak interactions aren't really weak. In fact, the coupling constant is the electromagnetic coupling constant. That's how they can be unified with the electromagnetic interactions. It's that they're very short range. All right, let me turn this thing off. Fine.